It's midnight and we're aboard the Java Gulf, steaming towards the dark heart of a civil war. The Java Gulf used to be an oil rig workship. Now she's a Red Cross medical shuttle, making a weekly run to Jaffna on the northern tip of Sri Lanka. The people on board are returning home from the relative safety of the south, where they've been receiving hospital treatment unavailable in Jaffna. Still hours ahead in the darkness, Jaffna is a city under siege. Isolated by a struggle between the Sri Lankan army and one of the world's most formidable guerrilla forces, the LTTE, or Tamil Tigers. This is the Navy instruction that don't pass in this close to the coast because sometimes there is sea mine and we don't know because nobody knows who is the one put the sea mine. Sea mines have already sunk a Red Cross ship here and while both sides respect the Red Cross's neutrality, there's a clear threat by the Tigers to destroy any ships or aircraft that dare approach Jaffna. Captain Abapo is taking no chances of mistaken identity. I notice it's uh, the whole ship is lit up like a Christmas tree. Yeah. Is that for any reason? Why is that? Yeah, we open, we open all the light for easy to distinguish by the Navy and maybe the LTT that we are from the Red Cross ship. So people don't shoot at the ship. Yeah. It's a precaution that paid off this very night. Beyond the glow of the ship lights, we'd learn weeks later, was a darkened freighter unloading a huge arms shipment for the Tigers. The light show had saved Java Gulf from attack. At the entrance to Jaffna's seaport, Java Gulf dodges the wreckage of 16 years of civil war. This is what the military doesn't want you to see. Navy supply ships sunk by Tiger Frogmen. On the wharf, the remains of a Navy patrol boat, testament to the Tiger's prowess. Jaffna is a city of symbolism in this ethnic conflict between the Tamil minority and Sri Lanka's Sinhalese majority. For the Tigers, this is the heartland of Tamil nationalism. They sprang from these ruined streets to wage their war for an independent homeland, nothing less than a third of the country, a demand the Sinhalese were never going to accept. Three years ago, the city was recaptured by the Sinhalese-dominated army. Now, amid reconstruction, the government portrays an image of normality, that Jaffna's half-million Tamils have returned to the national fold. Normal civil administration is functioning, and there are a few hiccups on and off, like would which would happen in any uh, area where there is a terrorist problem. The security has been provided and there is a certain amount of stability and normalcy within the area. You'll notice the fish net around the checkpoint. Yeah. The idea of that is to stop people throwing hand grenades into the checkpoint as they go cycling past. Australian John Dixon has run the United Nations refugee operations here for two years. You're in the jail. He's seen it all before in Cambodia and Bosnia and believes the government's story is flawed. It's controlled precarious. 
I think the government would like everybody to believe that things are normal in, uh, and getting back to normal in Jaffna. And very, very slowly they are, but it's not anywhere near at the speed or the rate of, uh, of reconstruction which the government say, uh, says it is. And it, basically the government, which is shooting itself in the foot by not being able to resolve the problems of security, of, of transport and the closed market economy. And of course this could all change again overnight. The, uh, the opposing forces could sweep in here overnight again. Absolutely. In fact, uh, we believe that there's a very strong carter in town at the moment, in the peninsula at the moment. The, the uh, LTT are here in force and can, if not take the peninsula at this stage, can certainly disrupt the, uh, uh, the lifestyle here very, very quickly. In the pre-dawn gloom, the soldiers begin their daily ritual. Officially, they say Jaffna is a cleared area, but in reality, at least 600 tigers operate underground here. An enemy that's everywhere and nowhere. Each night, tigers lay remote-controlled landmines, hoping to kill senior officers or Tamil collaborators. And every morning, the troops are out clearing them. They don't always succeed. In the past year, two generals and two Tamil mayors have been killed. They're undercover in Jaffna, but on the city's doorstep, the Tigers field a formidable force. Last September, they filmed their greatest victory of the war, overrunning this huge military complex just south of Jaffna. Waves of young Tiger fighters, mainly teenage boys and girls, inflicted staggering losses on the army. 1,500 dead, 2,000 wounded. The man in charge of this military disaster was none other than General Gunawadna, who was soon promoted to command all of Jaffna. You're trying to win a Hearts and Minds campaign. You're trying to gain the confidence of the local people. And yet a large, well-equipped army can uh, lose such a battle. I mean, what, what does that do to your standing, your reputation here? No, I, do, I don't consider that it was a loss as such. Because it was, uh, as I say, when, when the odds are against you, you have to take certain decisions. Now, I was the commander of that uh, division when this thing took place. And I gave the instructions for them to withdraw to a particular point from which they could defend themselves better. Army morale is now on the brink of collapse. A visible sign of this military malaise, increasing numbers of female soldiers and police on the streets of Jaffna, recruited to replace casualties, and the 20,000 men, one-fifth of the entire army, who've given up the fight and deserted. Most soldiers say this war is unwinnable, and surprisingly, their general agrees. Oh is mainly to keep on weakening the enemy so that a political solution can be reached. There is no military solution to this type of problem. The truth is a political solution is as impossible as a military breakthrough because for the Tigers it's all or nothing, a homeland or a glorious death. We'd arranged to interview a Tamil Tiger leader, expecting no doubt we'd hear firsthand why there's no room for compromise. Oh, oh. But on the day we planned to meet, the Tiger's Jaffna commander and his two bodyguards were killed in a shootout at their safe house. 
army surrounded them mm -hmm. and they fired. Okay. And they, these people also in turn fired mm -hmm. and they threw hand grenades. Even though a senior Tiger commander was killed, the war-weary people of Jaffna show little interest. Just three more dead in a conflict that's already claimed 70,000 lives. At Jaffna Hospital, volunteer doctors from Medicine Sans Frontier have enough trouble coping with the living. We averted the disaster, uh, the ceiling in one of the pediatric wards where we store, I hate to yeah. say, excess patients, uh -huh. which we've had a ton of excess patients, yeah. almost like a storeroom. Mm -hmm. the, it fell down. Yeah, the roof fell down. And thank thank God, God there were no patients there. We had moved them out the night before, but it could have been a disaster. Once again, the scenes here starkly contradict the government line that Jaffna is rising from the ruins. There's a desperate shortage of medical supplies. The hospital has just run out of plaster and is forced to use cardboard splints. Yes, people are dying every day and every minute from lack of proper care. And then, of course, drugs is a whole other story. Shortage of nurses. I mean, the other day I looked around in Ward 11, I could have cried because, uh, I mean, with all the mess, with all the patients we had there, two nurses trying to do the work of eight. Each morning, the Jaffna Lagoon Wharf is the scene of an extraordinary homecoming. The other side, four kilometres distant, is Tiger Territory. When the Tigers retreated in 1996, they took the entire population of Jaffna with them, a forced evacuation to the far side of the lagoon. Now, through the tacit and uneasy agreement of both sides, the refugees are coming home. And you get a lot of people coming through now? Yes, yes. Today, Many I think people? about uh, 100 people. 100 people. 100 people? Yeah. That's a lot a lot of people to move yes, through here. Yeah, yeah, always welcome to their people because we are all Sri Lankans, no? They may be welcome, but the soldiers aren't going to risk getting shot at in saving them. That task falls to the fishermen, many of them boys, no older than 12. So the police, the army don't come with us? No? We're on our own. The boys are forced to pole their way across as the army bans fiberglass boats and outboard motors fearing they could be used in tiger suicide attacks. Atop the rubble of what was a lighthouse, they patiently await our arrival. 23 people, three bicycles and a chicken. They've waded halfway across the lagoon under the cover of darkness, but dare come no closer fearing Jaffna's nightly shoot-on-sight curfew. And all these people from Jaffna, is Jaffna their hometown? These people have endured a life of hardship in tiger-controlled villages and jungles since 1996. The government says their return is a vote of confidence, but they're simply tired of the fighting and they want medical treatment. As we've seen, they're in for a bitter disappointment. <laughs> Tamil-speaking soldiers are a rarity. Most soldiers and civilians simply can't communicate. 
but they do recognise suspicious body language. But this is only the first round. The next stop in the interrogation process, a detention camp, where the questions are tougher and the suspicion greater. The Red Cross does what it can, handing out sleeping mats to the new arrivals, including 56-year-old Najalingam Somasundram. The army promises he'll only be here for 10 days, until he can prove he's not a tiger. But some have already been interred for five weeks. For Najalingam, with his wife killed, and news that his Jaffna home has been destroyed, the future is bleak. The government gains few converts through its endless cycle of arbitrary arrests. Leo Dixon, a Tamil security guard at the United Nations compound, has some bad news. He's just been handed a receipt for his son, detained by the army for being an acquaintance of a suspected tiger. His son, 20-year-old Patrick, was a Red Cross worker further south in the war zone until Leo asked him to come home and help the family by getting a local job. Yes. The arrest places Leo's other teenage children under suspicion. All too often in the past, those detained simply disappeared. A few weeks ago, workers digging a pit for a septic tank here at the local football stadium uncovered this mass grave. So far, 22 bodies have been exhumed from the site, and there's every indication that many more are still buried here. Without any firm evidence, the Sri Lankan army is already suggesting that this was the handiwork of the Indian peacekeeping force that was stationed here in the late 80s. The army has in fact shown very little enthusiasm for investigating this kind of thing. It was a local magistrate who insisted on this dig. And while this may be the first mass grave that's been uncovered, it may not be the largest. Army attempts to redress human rights abuses may have backfired when a young soldier convicted of murdering Tamil civilians claimed there was another mass grave containing 400 bodies. Fear prevents most Tamils from speaking out, but one institution has endured the ravages of war and continues to confront the army with its past. During the time, that is 1996, there were nearly about uh, 600 people were missing. Within a short time, one of the soldiers who was caught in one of the murder cases he gave a witness in which he said that there is a mass grave in Chaman. So from that day only, the people know that uh, all those people who are missing probably could have been buried there. The 
the Chimney site is just a short drive out of town. Tamils suspect incriminating evidence has already been removed, a concern reinforced by the presence of earth-moving equipment. A government inspection team has pegged the heavily guarded site with white flags, but media inspections aren't welcome. Yes, sir. Yes. No, don't take it. Uh, you... Uh... No. No. Four places has been ah. Here, four places. Yeah. Four places. Where, where are the others from here? Over there. Over there. Okay. How far? How far along here? Up, um, They've discovered a mass grave, with allegedly with 400 bodies in it. There's another mass grave over near the football stadium. Uh, here Where is in town. 400 bodies? Uh, that a young soldier being convicted. Yes, yes, yes. That is what he says. Yes. You don't believe him? Well. I don't think anyway, it's left to be seen. And there's, a, there's another one that's already started over near the football stadium. Yes. Those are all, I think, we were not there even when these bodies were buried. The army was not there. The General's rebuttal may be a little premature. Since our visit to Jaffna, a preliminary exhumation of Chemini has already uncovered the bodies of two men missing since 1996. One blindfolded and bound at the time of his death. In the past, the relatives of those detained who protested too loudly also disappeared. Leo Dixon asks us to accompany him to the army base in a bid to see his son. The second officer immediately contradicts his colleague, claiming the prisoner has been transferred to another camp. Ultimately, Leo got his son back, but lives with the fear that all his children are now suspects who can be seized at any time. Without a political solution, uh, there is no military solution. There has to be a political solution to this, this problem. And it is quite within the, uh, the power of both parties to achieve that. While they procrastinate and uh, continue to fight this senseless war, which is, it really is, uh, the people suffer. And you've got not only half a million people in Jaffna suffering, but uh, a lot more Singalese and uh, Tamils in the rest of the country suffering. In Jaffna town, prayers are offered to Ganesh, the Hindu god of good luck and success. Two commodities in short supply here. Meanwhile, just out of the city, war-weary troops line up to fly home, no doubt quietly thanking their own gods that they have survived. After 16 years, there's an air of mutual exhaustion on both sides, a mood ignored by government and Tiger leaders, determined to fight to the death. The troops run the gauntlet of Tiger anti-aircraft missiles for a few weeks home leave in the south. Many will desert rather than come back. But few Tamils have the luxury of flying out and leaving the wreckage of war behind. A city that they say has been reduced to an open prison. <laughs>